Thank you for joining us today for the third and final webinar in our machine learning series, Deep Learning for Audio and Natural Language Processing. We're happy to welcome today's presenters, Carlo Giacometti and Jerome Lourdeur from Algorithms R&D and Advanced Research Teams. Carlo will be presenting on some of the newest audio functionality in the Wolfram language, and Jerome will be speaking about natural language processing with neural networks. During the webinar, we'll share many online resources and links with you. My name is Cassidy Hinkle, Project Manager with Wolfram Research. I am your online host for this machine learning series. I am joined by several of my Wolfram colleagues behind the scenes to respond to your typed questions during the webinar and help point you to the resources you need. Feel free to submit your questions using the control panel on the right side of your screen. You can resize the windows to customize your webinar experience. We have had good success with Firefox and Chrome browsers, so if you do experience any problems with the screen sharing or audio stream, you might want to try logging out and logging back in with a different browser. Today's webinar is a great opportunity for you to learn more about deep learning approaches for audio and natural language processing. Links to the presentation notebooks and a recording of today's session will be sent to you in a few days, so you can continue to build on your understanding and work with the examples. Before passing the microphone to Carlo, I'm going to share a quick poll question asking about your motivation for participating in today's webinar. All right, so it looks like, like I said, a, a good majority of everyone is interested in both of the areas with some interested just in the audio and some just in the natural language processing. So I'm glad to see not very many people aren't interested in either. So let's do one more poll before uh, passing this over to to Carlo, I want to see what um, deep learning frameworks uh, you guys have already used or know about. And so go ahead and answer when you see the poll. OK, so it seems uh, fairly unsurprisingly that the majority of you guys is using TensorFlow, but with a, a non a negligible portion of you uh, being familiar with PyTorch and Chaos, and a bit of you. Uh, with Glue and MXNet as well. Okay, so I will go ahead and um, uh, start my presentation. So my name is Carlo Giacometti. I uh, am a kernel developer for Wolfram Research, and today we'll talk about um, um, neural network applications for audio processing. Um, the main topics that I will uh, touch upon today uh, will be First of all, uh, feature extraction business, how to feed an audio signal to a neural network. And then I will show examples of convolutional networks, recurrent networks for uh, audio classification problems. Then I will show an example of a sequence to sequence uh, network. And in closing, I will uh, give a quick overview of what we currently have uh, for audio processing in the Voltron Neural Net repository. So first of all, the main question is, what do we want to do uh, with an audio signal? What information do we want to extract? Uh, the basic one uh, that we can uh, uh, look for are the low level uh, descriptors. Uh, very basic things like the RMS amplitude, the spectral flatness, the loudness, um, all quantities ca that can be computed very easily from the sample values of the recording. Um, we might want to do some classification um, uh, of audio signals. So you have a recording as an input, and you want the probability of that recording belonging uh, to a specific class. Then there is the huge field of speech analysis. And of course, there are a lot of subcategories here. I just listed a few here. You can have voice activity detection. You can have speaker separation, speaker verification, speaker recognition. You can have transcription, which is like the uh, most common, I guess, task uh, uh, given a recording. You want to transcribe what was said. You could have event detection. Uh, you want to know what events happened at exactly what times. And there's the whole field of the music information retrieval when you have a, a recording. 
and you want high level information about the music that was played in that recording, for example, transcribe a score or uh, find out what key that recording was in or what chords were played, et cetera, et cetera. And until a few years ago, um, all of these uh, tasks were accomplished uh, using very handcrafted and fine-tuned features and extremely complex statistical tools. Now, as you all know, in the recent years, uh, machine learning neural networks had a huge impact on many fields, uh, including audio analysis. So the paradigm has shifted from uh, crafting these features and tools um, towards leveraging uh, massive amounts of computational power and annotated data. So instead of uh, uh, crafting all these features and tools, you just uh, grab a huge amount of data, throw it in an appropriate architecture, and let uh, the network train. And most of the state-of-the-art results, uh, for example, in speech analysis, in event detection, in music information retrieval, all of the state-of-the-art results currently, they are now leveraging either neural networks or advanced machine learning techniques. So, um, first of all, we need to know what an audio object is in the Wolfram language. Um, it's very simple. Uh, you can see this is an audio object. I will play it for you now. Hopefully, you will. Um, in its essence, it is just a sequence of values um, that are played at a specific time. Uh, we can plot these values using some uh, native function of the Wolfram language. So what is the main characteristic of this? This is a variable length sequence of values that can be extremely long. Uh, this is about two seconds of recording, and we have already almost 100,000 samples. Um, clearly, this is a kind of an unfriendly format for a neural network. So how do we feed this information into a network? Um, I guess you guys, uh, some of you at least, have been at the other webinars in this series, so you're familiar with the concept of net encoders. These are uh, constructs in the Wolfram language that uh, massage the input data into a format that a neural network is separate. And this massaging happens in a very optimized and parallelized way. So you can have collections of files in your hard drive, you can have extensive files, huge files, huge collections, and this will make it fast and efficient. Uh, in version 11.3, we introduced the net encoders for audio objects. Um, so we have a family of these audio net encoders. Um, there are some traits in this family that are common to all the net encoders. Uh, these are pre-processing steps that happen before the feature extraction. So first of all, we want our signal to be a single channel. So all the channels are averaged to a single one. We might want to have some form of normalization of the signal. So you want the loudness to be a specific value or the RMS amplitude to be a specific value. You might want to extract a specific part of the signal. So you might want to do either trimming or padding. The most, possibly the most important of all, you want to resample all of your collection to a common sample, right? Because you might have a, a collection of recordings and there's nothing that guarantees you that they will have um, all the same sample rate. Right? And the possible inputs for these audio net encoders are audio objects, of course, which is what you have seen here. But they can also be file objects. So you could have, as I said, a huge collection of recordings on your hard drive. And um, these net encoders will allow you to uh, train a neural network based on that uh, collection without having to import all that data into Mathematica beforehand. Here, the importing is done on the fly during the training. So um, I said these net encoders provide some form of feature extraction. What kind? So the most basic feature is just the waveform, the collection of samples, as I showed before. So here I am extracting the audio data, as I showed in the previous slide. Uh, as you can see, is a fairly long sequence. This, this first number is the number of channels. And again, you can see the plot. And this, this bit of code, essentially, is 
what the audio net encoder does. As I said, it already has all of the parameters that are common to all of the um, all of the encoders, so sample rate normalization, the target, and the target length. So, the, as I said, the problem says that the length can be very high. Here I am computing the length of all the example data collection that we have in the mathematical layout. And here I'm plotting a histogram of it. Uh, it's hugely variable and it can be extremely high. So one uh, way of compacting this data into a more uh, a format that's more common in, in neural network applications is partitioning this data. Here I'm partitioning with a certain window size with a specified offset. And as you can see, uh, this becomes a two-dimensional uh, matrix, uh, which is essentially what an image is. Uh, the first dimension is still variable. It depends on the duration of the signal. We will not get around that. Um, the other problem with this is that the signal in a partition uh, will vary dramatically on where the beginning of that partition is. Um, even a change of 1% in the uh, starting position of that partition can have a huge effect on the shape of the signal. Uh, essentially, what I'm trying to say is that the signal in every partition is extremely dependent on phase. Now, if we want to minimize the sensitivity phase, and maybe we want to have a representation that allows us uh, to uh, investigate both the time domain and the frequency domain, we can apply a Fourier transform to each of these partitions. And this is what I'm doing here, uh, applying Fourier to each of the partitions. And this is, in essence, what um, the audio STFT, which stands for short time Fourier transform, does. Uh, you see here we added two parameters, the window size and the offset, which are the characteristic uh, elements of the partitioning operation. Now, this. Uh, the, the size of the uh, of the output of this encoder is kind of problem slightly problematic at least. It has complex entries. The, the Fourier transform um, um, has um, the, the uh, oh the result of a Fourier transform is usually uh, complex values. Uh, one operation that is usually done to discard this phase information uh, is taking the absolute value of that. This is the magnitude spectrum. And we also can note that um, half of uh, a Fourier transform of a real signal is redundant. So we can, it, it is just uh, symmetric. So what we can do is discard the symmetric part and take the absolute value of it. And here I will plot this spectrogram here. So you have, uh, oops, there. Uh, this is the time and this is the frequency. So this is a, a representation that uh, appeals to us because this is how we hear in, in general. We uh, can recognize the evolution as a function of time, but we recognize sounds that are at different frequencies. This is what the audio spectrogram net encoder does. Um, now, the next step that we can take in our feature extra extraction is to mimic uh, the frequency perception that uh, we have as humans. Our frequency perception is definitely nonlinear. So one uh, common description of this nonlinearity is the melt scale. Um, this, if you see this, this is a representation of this mapping between hertz and melt scale. Um, it starts linear, but then it, it becomes more and more logarithmic. So what we can do is uh, filtering the spectrogram with these with um, bandpass filters that are spaced uh, linearly according to the MEL scale. So this is what I'm computing here. I am computing a filter bank of MEL filters, and I'm plotting the first few of them. As you can see, the spacing between them is nonlinear. Um, so let's uh, apply this uh, filter bank to the spectrogram. There we go. And you can notice the time dimension is, of course, the same, but the frequency dimension has dramatically shrunk. This is controlled by the number of filters that we used. So this is a plot of the result. 
um, same kind of thing as the spectrogram, you have a time axis, which actually uh, the, the legends are reversed, sorry about that. The time axis and the frequency axis. And the frequency axis is much more akin to what we are used to uh, in terms of frequency perception. And this is what the audio mail spectrogram net encoder does. And here we added some parameters for these uh, frequency filters. So minimum, maximum frequency and number of filters. The last step that we can take um, if we want to reduce the dimensionality of the computed features further is to compute the null frequency set style coefficients. So a common strategy is to apply the discrete cosine transform to the logarithm of the MEL spectrogram. Uh, in, in the Wolfram language, that is uh, accomplished using the Fourier DCT. And what is usually done is only the lower order components are kept and all the higher order components are discarded. And a, a usual uh, um, cutoff is the component number 13. It's very arbitrary and, and many different variations of this are used, but this is kind of a, a fairly common approach. This is a plot of the, of the result, again, with time and coefficient number axis. And we can uh, accomplish this using the audio MFCC net encoder. And the only parameter that has been added in this one is the number of coefficients. So uh, we started with a, a sequence of uh, about 80,000 elements, and we managed to reduce it to a matrix of 154 by 13. So we accomplished fairly successfully uh, a fairly dramatic uh, dimension reduction of our signal, hopefully while keeping a lot of the original information. So the other important thing to mention about this, uh, these audio net encoders is the efficiency that comes with them. Um, this the leverages uh, parallelization and out of core feature extractor. So you could compute, for example, MFCC features already uh, in Mathematica version 11, if I am not mistaken. But even uh, by using tricks like using parallel map, the timings for, in this case, I am considering a collection of 5,000 um, shared audio signal. They said the timings were uh, slow enough that um, it would not be feasible to do this operation online while training a network. And you can see the significant performance gains that uh, we have using um, the new net encoders. And in a very similar way, uh, the same thing happens for an out of core collection of um, um, audio recordings. So now, um, Let's move on to some practical examples of neural networks um, in the Wolfram language for um, audio processing. In most of the examples that I will show today, I will use this resource object, the spoken digit commands. Um, this is a subset that we um, selected from the speech commands dataset that was released by Google. So you, if you attended the uh, last few webinars, you're probably familiar with the MNIST image recognition uh, database. It is a collection of handwritten digits. And a lot of the basic example and benchmarks in image, uh, in image processing with neural networks are done onto this MNIST database uh, data set. So we wanted to have an analogous spoken MNIST data set um, into the resource system so we could retrieve all the data easily within the Wolfram language without having to manually download some uh, big data set hosted somewhere external. So this way we have access, easily, easy access to this. Mm. Uh, you could call it a toy data set, but it is a good example, a good testing ground for um, um, audio processing with neural networks. So we'll download here the training data and the testing data. And I will show a sample 
of three elements of the testing of the training data. Well, hopefully. Mm. Okay, this doesn't bode overly well. Let's try it again. Sorry, my connection evidently is not great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here we go. So this is a sample. Um, you can see we have three fields. We have an input field, a speaker ID, and uh, the expected output, which is a digit between zero and nine. I'm not sure if you could hear this, possibly not. Um, anyways, it's just as a, a recording of less than one second of this specific digit. So one important thing to note is that the speakers in the training data and in the test data are different. So you train your network on a set of speakers and then you want to test your network um, on a different set of speakers. So you make sure that the network hasn't learned about the specific speakers, but just the output. And it is generalizable to uh, different speakers that were not in the training phase. And you can check this by looking at the intersection of the speaker IDs in the training and in the testing data. As I said, the possible output values are all digits from zero to nine. Very conveniently, um, the length of all the input signals is between 0.5 and 1 seconds, and the majority of the signals is around 1 second. Um, let's see if this displays. Here we go. As I said, the majority of the samples is uh, around 1 second long. Uh, this is a convenient thing to keep in mind. So, um, as I said, convolutional neural networks. Um, I said we are playing with a spoken version of MNIST. So, uh, why not start uh, with uh, the network that is usually used in the MNIST uh, benchmark, the famous LANAP that I'm sure you have seen uh, in, one, uh, in one occasion or another. Um, so LANET expects a fixed size input. Specifically, it expects uh, 28 by 28 pixel images. So what we can do is uh, set all the parameters for our audio encoder uh, to produce um, samples, uh, to produce features that are 28 by 28 elements. Um, so first of all, let's um, grab the net model that corresponds to the net trained on MNIST data, and we want the uninitialized evaluation net. This means that uh, it is just the network definition. This does a, doesn't contain any pre-trained weights uh, or biases, mainly because all of the weights of biases and biases that are uh, uh, that would be trained on MNIST data, they would be fairly useless on the uh, data that we have, which is completely different. The only common thing is the fact that it will be a 28 by 28 matrix, but the content of this 28 by 28 matrix will be extremely different. So we will use an audio MFCC encoder. Um, this choice is so we can get a fairly small feature in terms of dimensions. Hopefully, while uh, keeping most of the information of the input signal. And we said we want um, a 28 by 28 matrix, so we set the target length to 28, and uh, the combination of um, uh, window size and offset uh, will guarantee that this target length will be one second. And uh, the other axis will be also fixed to 28. The number of coefficients will determine the dimension of the other axis. As you can see, the output, the, the net encoder conveniently tells us the size of the output. This will be a matrix that will be 28 by 28. So 
Linet, we can look at this here, um, expects an image as an input. Now this gets converted to a um, three tensor where uh, you have height and width of the image and number of channels. So we're missing this number of channels. Uh, so what we can do um, is convert this uh, 28 by 28 matrix to a three tensor by prepending to the network a replicate layer. So this will convert our 28 by 28 input into a one by 28 by 28 matrix, which is what Lenet expects. Now using net replace part, we, we can attach the encoder we defined up here and the appropriate net decoder to uh, the Lenet that we defined. So here we go. We have audio MFCC input and a class uh, net decoder at the output. So we want to speed up the convergence and we want to prevent overfitting. Uh, so what we can do is replace every convolution layer uh, with a combination of uh, itself and a batch normalization layer. Um, you can test this yourself. You can train the network with and without this batch normalization. You'll see the difference is quite dramatic. Um, this provides some kind of normalization between the nonlinearity uh, that speeds up the training significantly. And we can visualize the summary graphic of this network. So it is a fairly uh, straightforward network. It's a, just a linear chain with two convolution blocks and then a classification stack that, uh, that's composed of two linear layers and their nonlinearities. So we want to train this. Um, I will let NetTrain worry about all the hyperparameters, batch size, uh, learning rate, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see the network here, the training data. I want a net result object as an output. And here I define a validation set as a 5% of the training data. I will run this quickly. Um, I might stop uh, the training uh, just so we won't waste time. But you can see this will take less than 10 minutes to train. And I guess now it is slower than usual on my machine, mainly because I'm sharing. But, um, and my machine is fairly old as well. Um, so it is an extremely, um, thanks to the uh, audio net encoders, the training process is extremely fast. Um, I imported in the notebook a pre-trained version of the net uh, that was trained ex with exactly the same code. I'm not doing any tricks here. Uh, we can use classifier measurements on the network to measure the performance. And this hopefully will run quickly. Here we go. So just by using a standard arch architecture that's used in um, 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 image processing without putting almost any effort to adapting it to audio, we get a 90% accuracy. It's not bad. So now let's move on to something more audio specific. I want to look at uh, recurrent networks. So what we will do is we want to embrace the variable length nature of the problem. We want to specify in the encoder tar target length goes to all. So here we go. That's the only difference between this encoder and the one that we used pre previously. In this case, the output will be a matrix where the first dimension will be varying and the second one will be 28, uh, which is uh, controlled by this number of coefficients, as we said. We will use a recurrent uh, network architecture. Uh, it will be based on the gated recurrent layer, which is um, uh, a vari one of the many variations of uh, a recurrent layer. The idea is that uh, um, this layer will return um, its state every time step. Um, but each time step will have the uh, state information that comes from the previous time step. So what happens is at any time t, the network will have some information about all of the previous entries. So we, are, uh, we don't want, though, uh, 
a variable length output, we want a classification. So we have something of variable length that goes in, but we want a single uh, value as an output. So we, what we can do is using sequence last layer to extract the last state um, of the sequence of states of the gated recurrent layer. And once we have this last state, we can just use a couple of fully connected layers to do the classification. Um, so this is the architecture. As I said, it's very simple. It's a couple of gated recurrent layers. So you have a sequence of states. Um, here, this n by 64 is a sequence of states um, um, of the gated recurrent layer. This sequence last layer extracts the last of the sequence. And then we are just planning to classify this uh, vector of 64 elements into one of our 10 classes. Also here, the training is um, very quick. Also here, I will um, not worry about hyperparameters. As you can see, the speed is very comparable to the um, CNN architecture. I'll stop it again because we are kind of pressed for time. Um, you can see here in the previous output, I had uh, a sketch of the loss evolution, the evolution plot. And again, I am importing a network, a pre-trained network that was trained using uh, these exact functions. And we can measure, as we did before, the performance of this recurrent network on the testing data. And here we get 94% of um, accuracy. So quite a good result. Now, we can have an interlude here. Uh, we have we have a couple of pre-trained networks. So what can we do with these pre-trained networks? Sure, you give it an input and it uh, outputs uh, a number. Now, is there something more advanced or more interesting that we can do with that? So one option is to take, for example, the RNN network and uh, chop off the last two classification layers. Uh, the last uh, yes, the two, the last classification layer. So what happens here is with a variable length input, which is our audio signal, um, the output here is a single vector of size 64. And hopefully this single vector of size 64 will have a lot of semantic information uh, about the input signal. So what I am doing here is I am doing a feature space plot by using this chop network as a feature extractor. Um, so per each audio signal, uh, the extracted feature will be a single vector of 64 elements. And let's see if this computes fairly quickly, hopefully so. <laughs> this is taking a bit longer than When it is not sharing, hopefully we'll get it now. Here we go. And as you can see, just by computing the features with this chop network, um, we can see a very dramatic clustering of data that belongs to different classes. Um, so yeah, all of the trees are bunched here, all of the eights, all of the eights are bunched here, et cetera, et cetera. You can see there are some mis misclassifications, but still. Um, so this is a, a common paradigm. You train a network uh, on a big classification problem, and then you chop, uh, chop off the last few layers that do the classification work and use the chop network as a feature extractor. Now, we can also test this train network on a live signal. Um, so I will create a stream from my microphone. And I will use the current audio functionality, which is not yet released. It will be released in the next version. And keep in mind, this is still very experimental. So what I will be doing is get the data directly from my microphone and feed it in real time uh, to the network. And let's see if this works. Um, hopefully so. 
in any case, another thing you can do uh, if you want to test it on a one on a on a real signal, you can say you can record from your microphone. Let's see if this works. Seven. So here we get our nice recording. And we can feed the recording that we just did. Okay. Ah, maybe it does. And let's see. Okay. It actually worked. Excellent. Now, on to a slightly more complicated example. Um, we have done a classification, but what if we want to try transduction? Uh, we want a sequence of, in this case, MFC features to go into the network and another sequence of a potentially different length of the characters to come out of the network. So the first step is to add string labels to our data. Um, so the labels will be uh, the string to a corresponding digit. This will not be a general speech recognition net network because it will be exposed only to uh, 10 words in total. So uh, terrible speech recognition network, but possibly a good example of the general process that is necessary. So um, a recurrent architecture uh, doesn't in general change the um, uh, length of the input, the, out, the output length will be the same as the input length. Now, what we can do um, to collapse this uh, output length to something shorter, like a list of characters, we could use the CTC beam search net decoder. Um, so the net decoder um, with an input of M steps uh, and uh, M different classes, the net decoder will exp expect an input of dimensions n and m plus one, where uh, this plus one is the uh, a special blank character that is useful in the decoding process. And um, given this information, the decoder will find the most likely sequence of all states by collapsing um, all of the ones that are not separated by a blank symbol. So again, here we have the same net encoder. And in this case, we will use the CTC beam search net decoder. The architecture will be kind of similar to what we previously used. Uh, instead of a simple gated recurrent layer, we'll have a bidirectional gated recurrent layer, which means that uh, you apply the layer on a sequence, and at the same time, you apply the same layer on the reverse sequence, and you reverse the output. So at every time t, this uh, this layer will have information about both the future and the past. So this will be, again, the, um, the graph that we're considering. The training will just need to have uh, a loss function specified, in this case, the CTC loss layer. And uh, the same is exactly the same as the uh, other training processes. I, I, again, I will not uh, run it now. Um, I will import the network that has been trained with this code. So what do we get out of this network? This is um, the testing, a random choice of the testing data. So you have the input, the speaker ID, the output as a number, and the output as a string. Um, let's look at how the network behaves. As you can see, it outputs a list of uh, characters. Now, um, we can look at um, the output of the network before the CTC decoding, so the probability at each time step per each of the characters. So this is uh, time, and this is the character. The first row here is the blank character, and you can see this goes O, N, E. And we can show this uh, corresponding uh, on top of a spectrum. You can see this is temporal, temporally aligned uh, onto the spectrum. So this is where the one utterance is said. And as you can see, the, the characters are uh, time aligned with that. So we can look, th this network definitely can make spelling mistakes. 
so what we can uh, we can look at these spelling mistakes by uh, applying this network on all of the um, testing data and join the result and do a big work cloud of it so this is all of the examples that were classified as zero and as you can see that the coding works well all of the examples that were uh, belong to the one class and as you can see there are some misclassification there is some spelling mistakes etc etc we can fix a lot of these small spelling mistakes just by using a nearest function so if you have something like uh, six hole, uh, it gets corrected by six. Now we want to use classifier measurements um, to um, classify these string results um, into specific classes. So this is what we're building here. And let's see how it works. You, you can see the input is a list of characters and the output is an association where um, the values are the probabilities of the input belonging to that specific class. So the probability for all digits is zero, except for six, where it is one. And we can test this, we can measure this performance of the network this way using classifier measurements. And the results are quite good as you can see we get nine more than 95 percent accuracy on the testing data set but i think the more than the accuracy here the interesting thing is um, to look at the output of a recurrent network and how then the decoder converts this into a small list of characters Last thing I wanted to quickly talk about is the Wolfram Neural Net Repository. You probably have been introduced to it already. Um, the majority of the networks that are in that uh, deal with images and text, but we are planning to add more audio related models. Currently, we only have uh, two, I guess one and a half. Uh, one will be released within this week. So the first one and the most interesting one, I guess, is uh, Baidu's research, Deep Speech 2. And, uh, it is a fairly complicated network. Um, there is kind of some complex stuff going on in this net bidirectional operator. Um, this is trained on a automatic speech recognition task. Um, and the decoding uses a CTC beam search, which is what we have looked at uh, before. So I will show you how to, well, how to use it is very straightforward. So this is an example of an input. Right then, perfect Hopefully you timing. Have heard what this person said, and it is just easy to apply uh, the deep speech network onto the audio object. It is a fairly uh, resource intensive network, but it is very impressive in terms of results. Um, you can see it does have some spelling mistakes, but if you really want to uh, uh, use this and have very accurate, accurate results, you could potentially join this and one of the language models that are also present in the neural net repository. You can, for example, look at the um, top uh, decodings that the CTC decoder proposes for this input. Another one is a pitch detection network, which will be released. It should already be accessible like this. It will be released fully in the next week or so. Um, it's a fairly straightforward network. It's a chain of six convolutional stacks. Um, and the output represents the probability of the pitch being one in one of 360 frequency classes that are non-linearly spaced. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, unlike all of the networks that I shown before, this doesn't, uh, that doesn't get applied to um, a time frequency feature like spectrogram or MFCC, this gets applied directly on the time domain data. Uh, so it partitions the data in, in uh, partitions of about 1,000 elements, and the network gets applied to each of these partitions. And uh, you can um, define 
um, a hidden Markov process to um, decode the output of this network. And I will show you an example with this cello sound. That's just a single note. I chose it. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, there is some issue evidently with the um, version of Mathematica that I have. Anyways, um, once this net evaluation function is defined, um, the decoding of this is, uh, is immediate. It's just a matter of calling this function onto it. And with this, my presentation is finished. I will um, pass the microphone to Jerome and um, we will have a question and answer session after Jerome's presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you, Carlo. Okay, so now we are going to talk about uh, processing text data. So there is a point in common with the audio is that we are talking about uh, processing the sequences uh, with neural networks. So I will first introduce what is special about uh, text data uh, with respect to audio or images. And then I will present uh, yeah, four, four types of techniques uh, to, to process text. So for the embeddings, which is uh, present in all the processing. So we'll see what it is. Then I will show an example of classification of text, an example of uh, language models, and finally, uh, an example of sequence to sequence models that are used to do, for example, translation. So first, what is special about text? So it's that we have a, a variable length sequences of tokens. So what we call by tokens is a symbol. So yeah, languages are big sequences of symbols. And uh, in the world of neural networks, we, we, you, you can decide to, to, to model this symbol at several levels. So you, these symbols can be characters, words, and punctuation marks, or even multi-words, groups of words or sub-words. It, it depends on the, the task, uh, what is the most relevant. And also, when we, we talk about text, the scope can be different. So we can, we can process a word or a sentence or a paragraph, an article, a book. Uh, it really depends. To illustrate the, the, the token thing, uh, I, I will show how we can uh, we can tokenize, that is to say, to split this string into some symbols uh, differently. So he did a 360, uh, yeah, so it can be uh, tokenized like this with word and punctuations, but we can decide also to, to do special things for, for digits if we want a model that will be good at, at processing digits, for example or we can decide to tokenize in, in character like this. And also, uh, it's the, the text has some underlying structure, uh, like we can show it with text structure. But uh, in practice, with neural networks, it's not very um, successful nowadays that the approaches that try to uh, first find the structure and then exploit this structure. Because uh, uh, if you make an error uh, when detecting the structure of the text, uh, then the rest will fail. And actually, the structure is very complex and even anodetic. Uh, it's not well defined in the sense that if you ask several people what is the structure of a given text, you might have different answers. Not in this simple case, but in more complicated case. So yeah, in my presentation, in all the approaches, I, I will treat the text as a flat sequence uh, of symbols. Then the neural networks, they take inputs, which are text, and they output something, and the output will depend on the application that you want to do. So for example, if you want to do classification, the, the output will be a single class or probabilities of our classes. So application are sentiment analysis and topic classification. So for example, there is already a sentiment classifier in the language. Uh, you, you give a text and it just output a class or probability of classes. And the regression problem is we have also this sequence of symbols and you want to output a number. So for example, sentiment analysis is again an application where you may want to, to score the sentence with respect to its probability of being positive. And then there are a group of tasks which are called transduction, where the output is also a sequence. So there are, I distinguish two cases. In one case is where the, these sequence are the same length as the input sequence. So for example, is the part of speech uh, tagging, where you have a sequence of words and, and you want to tag 
what is the role, the grammatical role of these words within the sentence. There is also uh, name identity recognition. So you, you are given a sentence and you want to detect like this, uh, where are the person, where, where are the cities, the dates, and all kinds of entity types. Uh, there are also language model, which I will illustrate uh, later when you want to, to predict the, the probability of a sequence. And usually it's done by predicting the probability of each symbol given what, uh, what comes before. And another application is to find question answering by pointing something in the text. So actually you're given a text, which is a list of symbols. Uh, you are given a question. For, so for example, here we ask, uh, where is born Michael Jackson? And actually the model is going to give the, the position. So in terms of characters, so either you can modelize it with words or character, but this model works by uh, uh, detecting first the start position and then the end position. So you've got the same number of input and outputs in the network. And here, for example, it's outputting Gary, and you can watch the, the position of Gary in the original st string. Okay, and if I, if I ask when he's born, then it will focus on another word with another span. Okay, and there are also a bunch of, uh, a group of applications where the output sequence has a different length than the input sequence. So for example, machine translations, translating a language to another, but it can be also more general, like tr translating natural text to, uh, to a program, for example, writing a program from natural text. All these kind of applications, you don't know in advance the, the length of your output sequence. Also for text summarization, you are given a big text and you want to summarize it. Or question answering, the same application like before, but by generating a text, like here in Find Textual Answer, it will always give a span which comes from the input, but maybe you want to generate the output Okay, and conversational modeling also. So a few words about uh, processing text. So there are basically three steps that are done. So I already talked about the tokenization, like uh, yeah, transforming a string to a list of symbols. Then you may want also to clean the text, uh, like to, to remove the to remove the stop words or to to lower case, to to do stemming also. Stemming is a um, it's a rule-based approximation of lemmatization, so it's about remo removing the plural forms and the infinitive forms of the verbs. But stemming yeah, is, a, is only rule-based, so it can create words that do, do not exist, like the R here, uh, which come from this. Uh, normally, lemmatization would, would be like the infinitive verb for, for this one, but stemming is only based on rules. Okay, and then once we have uh, these symbols, which are string, we have to convert them to indices because it will be to convert some to, to handle strings uh, in neural networks. So first we want to convert them to indices uh, and then later, later on to vectors, so numerical vector, and then it's uh, usual neural networks. So there are two ways of, uh, so there are already two net encoders uh, to process text in the language. There is one which will output uh, uh, so net encoder characters, which will out output indices corresponding to some characters. So if I if I put three three characters, it will output three indices. And there are a lot of options where you can specify your set of characters, including special characters like start of string and end of string. And the other useful one is the net encoder tokens, which take which will produce words. So, so for example. I give it two, wor two words like this, I will have two indices at the end. Okay, and then once we have these indices, uh, usually we, we map them to, to some vectors, which can be learned. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so this is my next section. We call this embedding. It's the process of uh, mapping a symbol to a vector, which is uh, supposedly uh, semantically uh, meaningful. So the most basic embedding is called one not encoding, and in the language it's called uh, unit vector la layer. So yeah, it's just a layer that will output uh, a vector with the same size as the, the number of tokens it has in, in the lexicon, and with one activated, like for example, if we put the unit vector on characters on the word yellow, so it will produce uh, four, uh, Four, four numbers, yeah, and here it's only activated at the index which corresponds to the letter H, E, L, L, O. Yeah, sorry, there are five characters and 
two times L that we see here. Okay, so this representation is not learned basically, and uh, but we can also uh, what is more typical actually is to map all the indices to a vector of uh, arbitrary size. So this is done with the embedding layer. And it will map, so for example, if I do the same with the word hello, but I want a, a dimension of 30, whereas before I was uh, stuck with the number of characters in my dictionary of characters. Uh, so here I have for every row correspond to a character and I have 30 dimensional vectors, which are random, but which can be learned later on. And actually, if you, if you chain a unit uh, vector layer with a linear layer, uh, is the same as doing an embedding. Like I show here, I, I took the, the weights, learn, and put them in an embedding, and I, I got the, the, twice the same results here. Okay, so this is the general principle of embeddings, and they can be applied to, to, to the tokens, so to characters, to subwords, words, or, or multi-words. And actu actually, there, there were uh, hist historically these embeddings were the, the first breakthrough in uh, natural neural networks for natural language processing. So there were word 2 vec and, and Glove, which are uh, which yeah gave some uh, some performance improvement in all the models. So so they were trained basically by uh, scrapping huge uh, database of text and. Uh, yeah, having some criterion based on the co-recurrence of uh, words. Uh, yeah, for example, they were learning representation that are good at predicting the next word or the surrounding words, or by matrix factorization techniques on the co-recurrence mat matrices of words. Uh, they come up with some meaningful representation, uh, semantic vectors for the words. So here we see the dictionary. Uh, so, so there are yeah four four hundred thousand words in this model, and uh, to illustrate how semantic they are, so here I took three lists of words which are in different categories: animals, colors, and fruit. And if I if I plot them using a feature space plot, then I see the, the three groups are are uh, well distinct. So it means uh, it encodes the meaning. These vectors encode the meaning of the words. And so they are very good, for example, to, to solve the ambiguity, the um, synonymic uh, uh, stuff. Yeah, for example, you have two words that, that this t means the same thing. If you if you have seen them uh, a random, uh, uh, well, the distance will be close with this, and and, and you your neural networks won't have then if you feed them with these word embeddings to learn which word are synonym. You already have it uh, as an input. Okay, and uh, also uh, there are some interesting properties. For example, in this plot, you can see that uh, going from the male, uh, from the male general, like going from uncle to aunt, or from king to queen, or to prince to princess, is like it's always the same translation vectors. So not only the distance are are meaningful in this space, but also the linear transform means something. And so, for example, you can uh, do some arithmetic uh, operation. For example, king minus man plus woman uh, equal to queen. This kind of things. So there, there is the something. Uh, so here, all these models are in the network repository that uh, that Carlo already advertised. And I think. And so you will see by domain with text. You will see that there is a lot of. Uh, of these embeddings, the glove embeddings. Uh, yes, and another one is this one, ConceptNet. Uh, this one has the particularity of working on phrases, that is to say, on group of words. So for example, here, I plot the nearest neighbors of live in peace. Uh, and actually, I plot it here. Uh, yeah, and, and you see so that there is a cluster here of words, which are rather positive uh, expressions. And then you, you, have, a, you have also the, the antonymic which are not so not so far away, which means that there is a component in this vector which, which, uh, which like which knows that peace and war are are close together in terms of, in terms of topics. And it's also multilingual, like it contains some word. I would not pretend it, it can do translation, but here I do some arithmetic. Bonjour, uh, which means hello in French, minus hello plus goodbye, and we see our appearing, which means goodbye in French. 
okay more interestingly because these word embeddings they uh, apply a, a vector to a word independently of uh, what uh, what happens uh, around this world so actually they solve synonymy but they do not solve the ambiguity of a word that can mean several stuff and depending on the context it can mean several stuff uh, yeah so recently uh, Allen's institute released uh, some uh, very interesting word embeddings which are now in the in our repository uh, and which have a uh, two to two, two main uh, good, good points, let's say. Uh, first, they are only based on character embeddings, like uh, they don't have any, it's not based on a dictionary of words because the problem with the, the token embeddings is that if you got a word that is new, uh, that is not in the dictionary, then you can only assign some arbitrary vector to it, but you are not going to process it uh, correctly. And so in these embeddings, they start from uh, character embeddings. And, and uh, so, so, so yeah, I, I will use this representation of neural networks in my presentation. So yeah, the sequences have to, have to be read from, uh, from top to, to, to bottom. And then uh, each, each little square rectangle here is, is a vector and the big boxes are, are the layers. Okay, and so what happens in this model is that you first convert uh, characters to indices, then you you feed the uh, of an embedding layer that that assign a small vectors to each characters, uh, and and after you've got uh, layers of convolutions apply, and then a max pooling on these convolutions, and then it produces one vector for one word, and then this list of word uh, is is fed uh, goes into a recurrent neural networks that Carlo already introduced that are very popular to process sequences. And this is the part that con, uh, that gives uh, to, to these embeddings the fact of being context dependent uh, because the output after the recurrent layer of a word will depends on what comes before and one comes what comes after. So yeah, this is the model in our repository. So yeah, this was a simplified uh, sketch that I made uh, because actually the, concerning the, the convolution, this is this part that are running uh, several convolutions in parallel with several sizes of kernel. So it's like uh, looking at one, one gram, two grams, three grams, etc., of characters. And then they combine in everything. Then they have this uh, skip connection, which uh, which is known as the highway uh, network architecture. Then at this point here, uh, they have uh, an embedding that is not context dependent. So here each word was treated independently. And then it's, it's fed to the two, la two levels of neural networks. Uh, and then it's pro producing not only one, but uh, three, uh, three vectors. Uh, actually, they released it like this. So, so th this at this point where we are context independent, we can access this. So we have an embedding that is context independent, and then two two embeddings that are context dependent and more or less higher level, like it's uh, one layer of bidirectional RNN or two layer of bidirectional RNN. And so if you give it two, two words, you will have uh, yeah two two vectors for each one of these ports, uh, which are dimension one thousand. 24. And Allen's Institute uh, recommend to, to use by default the averaging of the of this three embedding. So that's what I am doing here. I'm just t taking the, the network, uh, adding this threading layer, which uh, which is computing here the average of the three ports, and I'm connecting uh, the three ports uh, whose name I get using netform information yeah, to the threading layer, which is here. And then I have only one port output of size uh, 1024. Okay, which I can see it if I give it. Okay, and now let's illustrate what uh, the fact that these embeddings are context dependent. So here I give several sentences with the starting with the word apple uh, in different contexts. So sometimes it means the the fruits, sometimes it it, it means the company. Oh, sorry, uh, there was a problem with the presentation mode. Uh, okay, 
Okay, I was here. It does not want to. Okay, so yeah, here it's a feature space plot. So with the embeddings, and we see that we clearly distinguish the three sentences that are talking about Apple, the company, and the, from the three sentences which are talking about Apple, the, the fruit. So with these embeddings, we are going to disambiguish the, the word Apple, depending on the context. So now I am going to to show with an excellent part of text classification how to use this embedding uh, yeah, for a real application. So I took sentimental analysis on a, as an application. Uh, so we have a data set in our, in our repository of data, which is about a movie review. So you have sentences uh, which are review about the movies and they are assigned positive or negative label depending on if they are negative or, um, uh, or positive. So uh, I tested three models. First, random embeddings. So I took the glove one, and uh, when you call the model, you can specify that you want the uninitialized net. So you will only have the, the same architecture, which is only one layer in this case, but it will be uninitialized. So you, you, you have the same, uh, yeah, the same stuff, but weights will be random when you train with, with it. And I put it in a classical architecture, yeah, which I should present, by the way, of uh, classification. So in classification, yeah, you have your embeddings of words, for example, and you can fit it either to a convolutional neural network, as illustrated here, or a recurrent neural network, uh, yeah, something that will uh, combine all the information in the sentence. Then you have to pull. It can be done with the uh, max pooling or uh, in the case of neural networks, you can also decide to take only the last uh, the last vector also. Yes, yeah, the, the, the recurrent um, can be bidirectional or not. And then once you have a vector, it's the classical approach. You feed it to a classifier, which can be only a linear layer and a softmax layer. Okay, so this is uh, the architecture I did here with my embedding layer that is going to be randomly initialized. That's why it's red now. Uh, I feel it to a bidirectional neural network, some dropout to regularize, some linear layer, uh, aggregation layer of max to do some global max pooling, uh, then a linear layer and soft max. Okay, I'm not going to run the, the trainings here to, to be fast. I pre-computed them, so yeah, this one gives this one. After I do the, the same, uh, exactly the same uh, experience, but I take the real glove, not the uninitialized one. So, the f so you see here it's not more red, the first embedding layer. So it means it's initialized, and I've got this results. Okay, I don't know if you noticed here I had the uh, 26 uh, validation error. Here I am 21, so I already improved. And if I took, uh, if I take now the the Elmo, so. So like I, I said, I illustrated before, I take the average of all the embeddings uh, that the Elmo gives. As this one is computationally expensive to, to compute, uh, what I recommend to do is to pre-compute, and Allen's Institute also recommend this, to pre-compute them on your data set, and then to train uh, your classifier that is on top, what is on top on it uh, as a separate stuff. So yeah, I won't run it also here because it's it's taking some times, but I can pre-compute my training data and my validation data, the outputs of the Elmo. And then the, the hat I'm going to put on the on the network is all, all the following. So the dropout, the linear, the pooling, and the classifier with the softmax. And now, yeah, when I train this, the results are, are much better. Uh, so yes, I sum up everything like these are the three conversions curve so with the so this is the validation error rate uh, uh yeah going through the the training so we see that the random embeddings is performing worse and elmo is performing the, the best and then we have also the chart of the three validation rates so we clearly see that the yeah using pre-training embeddings helped and this is the power of uh, transfer learning Okay, so language model, some generalities there are, so language model is, is about uh, pr predicting the sequence of the next word given 
the, the beginning of the sentence. And typical uses are, for example, auto completion, or they are also used to improve speech to text or image to text system as a post processing. Like if your if your acoustic or optical model uh, do do some mistakes, then maybe knowing the language, you, you can correct them. Uh, it can be used also for data augmentation. Like if you are able to generate text, maybe for some tasks, uh, you are going to use a, this automatic. Uh, generator to have more training data if you know how to label uh, some data and it can also be used for fun like you can create pseudo words or stories or article out of nothing so the, the architecture is the following actually it's very similar to classification but you are just going to classify given the history so so classical stuff is to do recurrent neural networks then to take the last uh, yeah, the, the last representation to predict the next word, uh, basically. So we have in the net, uh, we, are, we started to fit the net repository also with some models. So this one was uh, was learned on uh, on English. Uh, and yeah, I should specify, oh, sorry. The, yeah, so once you have this, this network, as the output encoder is the net decoder class, you will be able to call uh, on it all the property of the net decoder class. So for example, if you want the, you can ask for the top probabilities. Uh, so here, for example, I gave uh, WH as the beginning of the sentence, and uh, I asking for the probability of the next letter. And we can see that there is I, E, Y, and I, and O coming first, which uh, give rise to all the Y question, like what, where, why, uh, while, or with, or whose, or all this kind of stuff. I can, by, by default, if I ask, it will be the output, will output me the, the most probable one, and then I can ask for a random sample also. Each time I call it, it will give me a random sample, sample from this distribution. This is the, the distribution for the character that is estimated, and it will sample from this. And then, uh, from this model, we can sample uh, yeah, as many characters as, as we want next, and it can be done uh, efficiently during net state object. So net state object was introduced in the last version, and it's an object that stores a network and all its intermediate activation. Because when we are going to generate, so you are going to generate here, uh, given the begin, uh, the next characters, but then you are going to feed the input, and uh, you want the next character. But instead of passing again the full sequence, uh, you don't want to do this. So you want to store uh, the internal state where you were at, uh, at the last point. Uh, so this uh, recurrent state, basically, uh, to, to continue. So that's what is done in net state object. So what, what we want, for example, to do, yeah, typically we want to sample like this. And then we, if we add the A, it will give the next one, then I add the T. That's what we are going to do with this function here, generate random, which create a net state object with the network. And then it's going to nest it. So just to, to show what is going doing a nest list. So if you give it a, a list and the start and the length, ah, no, sorry. Something is wrong. Uh, no, no, there is no list. Sorry, just a start and the length. And I have to put something real for the length. Yeah, so it will uh, give you the start. Then what you predict on the start, then it will apply a nested function of f. So if you do it, uh, yeah, repeatedly on your sequence, then you will uh, generate all the characters, and you only have to do a string join after. To get the results and so i can generate a random sentence like this which are more more or less funny or if i want to generate a, out of nothing i can generate a point and then it will start a new sentence so for that augmentation it can be used or if i want to start with a, a given name i can do this okay i I have a part to show how to train this kind of models yourself, uh, but actually, as it is very similar uh, than what, or maybe I can do it very quickly. 
uh, to introduce a notion that will be useful after. So yeah, you will take a text corpus, you will analyze, for example, the characters that you have in your corpus, define your network, and then to train it, we are going to, to use what we call teacher forcing. So I remind that the network has to predict the next characters, uh, and teacher forcing consists in uh, just ignoring the, what predicts the network, uh, you just feed with the next target. So, for example, you have the start of sequence, you have to predict the T. Whatever will predict the network, you you copy the T as the next input of the network, and then it continues. So, this is what we call teacher forcing. And in our framework, it can be implemented with the sequence rest and sequence most layer. So, that's what we are going to see in this picture. So I take my input, uh, my input, yeah. I remove the last character and I give it to my network that has to predict the the, rest, uh, the next characters. And then uh, if I give it, give it also to a sequence rest layer, it will remove the the first uh, the, the first frame, uh, the first symbol, sorry. Uh, and then I, I will have this shift like this and do a teacher forcing. So after I plug with my loss, which is a cross entropy, uh, classic, classical for uh, for classification. Uh, yes, and then uh, yeah, this is a function. Uh, also, this is practical for text processing because normally the databases are huge. Here I'm showing how to use a data generator. That is to say, instead of passing to net train uh, data set that has already all computed, I pass it uh, a function that generates uh, my sample. So if, for example, I define a function that will uh, go and, and get some uh, some substrings from my big text corpus of size between uh, 5 and uh, 30. This is purely arbitrary. Uh, and there is a batch size also. Like uh, if, I, if I say 8, it will output me 8 samples. So these are uh, random crops, uh, if we can say so. Uh, of the of my big corpus, and these are my training samples. Like this, I, I show to the network variable length sequences, etc., uh, etc. Et so here again, I don't show the training, but it, it converges. And then I have uh, I have to extract the net and the prediction part of the net because I remember that the, the network was uh, was wrapped into another network like this, uh, which was only to have the teacher forcing uh, thing like this layer loss you don't need it after when you want to use the network so that's why here i have net extract and i only extract the prediction part okay yeah this one is basically to reattach the net encoder and i also add a uh, wait wait some surgery I, I forgot the detail of uh, everything but the important point is that you are, you want the, the net encoder and the net decoder to be, to be back so it's to say here input is a string it means that I have implicitly a net encoder uh, of characters or token attached here and if I extract only this part then I will lose it so I have to reattach it after and after uh, yeah, I, I can predict uh, like I was doing with the with the previous one. Okay. Okay, we are now coming to the last part of this presentation, which presents an important class of model, which are named sequence to sequence or sec to sec, and which take an input sequence and generate an output sequence without any constraint, any particular constraint on the length. The output sequence can be shorter or longer. It's not like uh, with CTC that presented Carlo previously. With CTC, we have to produce a shorter sequence and somehow the alignment between the input and the output sequence has to be monotonous. But here we don't have this constraint. So sec to sec are a very important class of model that can tackle a large number of applications so to, such as the machine translation where you translate a language to another or text summarization when you want to, to shorten the text and not necessarily linearly scroll through the text to produce the summarization, or conversational modeling where you want to produce an automated bots. There are also speech to text, text to speech, a lot of applications. First, I will present the, the baseline sec to sec model before uh, showing an improvement based on sequest attention. 
So the model was proposed in 2014, and basically there are two parts in the model. The parts that encode the input sequence, so given an input sequence, we are going to produce a fixed size vector that encode all the information of the input sequence, and the second part that will decode, so using this encoded uh, representation of the input sequence, it will uh, feed it to a first state of a recurrent neural network, and then we will uh, generate the output sequence one token at a time, so starting, so actually this recurrent neural network here is fed with an embedding of what was previously generated, and as the, in the beginning we have nothing, so we feed the decoder first with a special token to stay, to, to, to tell him, okay, start the decoding, and then, uh, so using this, uh, this representation here of the input sequence, it generates one token. So at the end here is just a, classi a classical classifier that uh, decide uh, which output tokens to, to produce. Then we feed again this previous token to the decoder, uh, again and again, until it produces a special token to say, okay, uh, stop decoding. So in terms, in the Wolfram language, uh, it's done like this. So first, this is the, the net chain that encode the input sequence so with just an embedding layer, a recurrent layer, and we take the last vector uh, on this recurrent layer to produce a fixed size vector here of size 100 that represents the full input sequence. Then the decoder uh, as an embedding layer that takes the prev what was previously encoded, then a recurrent layer, and here we connect the state, uh, the first state of this uh, recurrent layer to the encoded uh, sequence vector. And then a classi classical classifier to produce the next token. As for the language models that were presented before, we are going to train this using teacher forcing, which means uh, that we feed <coughs> the input of the decoder with the real targets and not what the model predicted. So yeah, in this part of the decoder, I remind that the decoder has two inputs, the, the encoded sequence and what it previously decoded. And here we are just going to fit the input of the decoder with the, the, the target, uh, yeah, using the special start token, uh, and then it will produce, uh, yeah, in the same space, uh, yeah, the target and a special token to end generating. Okay, so the teacher, of the, it, the teacher forcing tree can, can be done by wrapping the decoder and the encoder into another network, which is similar also to the teacher forcing for language models. The only difference is here we have this encoder part that fits the decoder part, but after it's the same, we have sequence most and sequence rest layer to shift, uh, to do the shift of the target. And so the decoder, uh, yeah, each sample will be the full uh, target to predict, the full input and target pair to predict. Okay, and so I'm going to illustrate it on the problem of uh, integer addition, but with strings. So we, we want to pass a string where we depict an addition of uh, integers and we want the results. And so it's a toy problem of, of course, you can generate as many examples as you want to, to study this problem. And it's an interesting problem for translation because it's not a, a linear, a, a monotonous alignment between the input and the target like to this side of this five, you have to look at this three and this two here, and then to, look, to produce this eight, you have to look at this five and, uh, and this three, and maybe you have to add one depending on the results that you, you had before. So it's uh, an interesting translation task, I would say, to perform integer addition. Okay, so here I generated some uh, synthetic data set. Here I split into uh, training and validation, so I'm not showing the training. Uh, I'm not running the training during this presentation. Only uh, showing the results that you can obtain after one minute of training on the GPU. It's doing less than a one percent error, uh, so it's working. And now I'm going to show how to use this train network. There, there is a little bit of surgery to do. So uh, because if I only extract the network from the results, you, you see, you, you, you still have the loss and the, yeah, everything that was added to do teacher forcing. So this, we can remove this part using net take. We take only the encoder and decoder part. Then 
we take separately the encoder. Okay, it's on a chain. And the decoder, which is this part. Okay, these are the trained ones. And we have to do uh, some surgery on so also on the decoder to be able to uh, use it. So the first thing is that, yeah, the difference between training and decoding is that when training, we were filling the decoder with the full uh, target to decode. But when we are decoding, we are producing one token at a time. So it's the difference. So we are going to, to have a procedure where we fit the token, the decoder with one token at a time. And if you use the same net, net encoder characters as an input to this decoder, the problem is that you will uh, always output three tokens when you fill with one character. So you could have the input string here and produce the special tokens. Okay, but it, it, it won't fit. So instead we have to change this encoder for net encoder class, uh, where each character is a class and the empty string is also a class that will produce the end of string uh, token. Okay, and so it's working, it's producing if I put one character or zero character, it's producing one token at a time in the decoder. Okay, and the second uh, tricky detail is that this state here has to be uh, removed because we are going to feed it manually using net state object. So, okay, so we take the network and we just remove this state. Now we can wrap this decoder into a net state object as before, which has, you see, one recurrent state here that I can programmatically obtain using that information. So I have the name of this state to be fed manually. Then I can write my uh, function to decode that will just take the input sequence, produce the encoded vectors. Then I wrap the decoder into a net state object that will keep, uh, keep trace of the intermediate states. I keep in memory all the internal states. I will uh, initialize it with the encoded sequence as the first state. And then before I was using nest list with for language model, here I use fixed point list, which does the same, but which will stop when the results uh, does not change anymore. Because actually when we are going to produce the output uh, token to, to stop decoding, uh, yeah, we did the trick to map uh, this to the empty string. So when the results does not change, it will means to stop. Okay, and I can decode with this. You see, it's working, it's performing. Uh, digit, uh, an addition, uh, addition of integers by, based on strings. And I can also compute the outputs on my full validation set and compute the accuracy using classifier measurements. So we have uh, about 90% accuracy, so 10% of errors. So it's different from the error, the error rate we have during training because during training here, uh, this 1%, it's related to the, to the error rate token by token for each token that you generate. But uh, yeah, actually we are, each input, each output is a sequence of tokens. And so this accuracy here of 10 per, of 90% uh, is the, at the level of the sequence that you generate. And it's the real accuracy that you are interested in because as soon as you do one error on one token, if an, even if your output sequence has 10 tokens, it must be counted as an error. Okay, now I come to uh, an, an announcement of the sequence to sequence uh, model with attention, uh, which are now the state of the art for machine translation. And so a drawback of the previous approach is that uh, an input sequence is encoded into a fixed size vector and uh, whatever the input uh, length is. And actually it's, it will always be limited, like you cannot encode a huge sequence into a fixed size vector. And uh, the using attention permits to get rid of this limitation. So because we are going to represent a, sequen a sequence uh, as, as an encoded sequence with a variable length, I'm not going to keep one vector only for the sequence. And at the decoding, what happens in attention is that this intermediate representation of what we uh, previously decoded uh, is going to assign weights to all the encoded vectors of the input sequence. So these attention weights are all positive and sum to one, and we use them to compute a linear combination of the encoded vectors, and it gives a context vector. So it's 
Be before we have only one, we had only one context vector for the full decoding process. And what changed here is that at each step of the decoding, we are going to produce one different context vector, which depends on the input sequence and on what we previously decoded. And it's going to change in each time. And then we concatenate basically this context vector with the hidden representation of what we previously generated to produce an attention layer. So it's more or less similar uh, than, the, than the model before, but instead of keeping only one vector here, we keep the full encoded uh, sequence and there is an attention mechanism uh, in, in the middle. So at each step of the decoding, I remind we, we assign weights to all these encoded vectors, which produce uh, uh, one context vector here, and we concatenate it with the hidden representation of the decoding, and then, uh, like before, we generate a new token that will be fed into the decoder unless a special token is encountered. Okay, in the notebook, so I don't have time to explain all the details, but I showed you how, how to generalize and not have a unidirectional but bidirectional MNN here. It's possible. And the decoding part is very similar, but instead of uh, having only one input, so we on, uh, before we had two ports, the previous, what was previously decoded and the context vector. Now we have also a global context vector as before, but also the input sequence that will be fed into attention. Uh, so attention takes the input encoded sequence and the output of the recurrent layer in the decoder. Okay, and then we concatenate this and fit this into uh, the classifier for the next token. As before, we train it with a teacher forcing, nothing special here. Okay, we train the model. It's a bit longer to train because, and it's a bit better also. I don't know if you remember, but the error rate was half by two here. Uh, and we do some surgery as before, extracting first the train network without the loss, then the encoder, so which has two output ports, the decoder. Okay, we, we change the net decoder and net dec and decoder of the decoder. We also remove uh, this global internal state here. And so now we have, uh, we have uh, yeah, this port uh, to initialize using net state object. Also here the, the, the decoding function is similar as before and we can apply it and check that it works and we can compute the validation performance and check that it's a bit better. Yeah, it's a bit better than before. Okay, it's not a big breakthrough, but it, it was a toy application, but in general, using attention uh, brings a lot of improvement. So it's time to conclude. So to build uh, uh, applications of uh, natural language processing, your neural networks, there are like uh, three important, three or four important pieces to achieve a first, uh, the first step is to convert text to a list of tokens or tree of tokens. Today I presented only approaches with list of tokens because the approaches with trees are not state of the art yet. Uh, then we convert all the tokens which are symbols, which can be ca uh, characters, sub, sub words, words or multi words. We convert them to some vectors which are supposed to be semantically uh, meaningful in the sense that the distance in this semantic space uh, is representative of the semantic distance of two words. And then to build the full network. Uh, so again, I advise to visit first our model repository, so our model zoo, to see if there are not a network or a piece of network that can be reused for your application. So we have a bunch of pre-trained uh, embeddings, for example, you don't need to train it yourself. You should rather take a pre-trained one. And then the layers, for sequences are uh, convolutional layers, recurrent layers, and sequence attention layer. These are the, the main uh, layers uh, to process sequences that are interesting for text. And then after, uh, once you build your network, of course, you have to feed with your, your data that to, to be relevant and to optimize. Uh, and NetTrain uh, does a really good job with uh, optimization methods uh, 
that are automatically chosen and that are well suited to, to train on sequences. And so the interesting links are, are yeah, our model zoo. There is also great tutorials on the Wolf, uh, on neural network with a special uh, section on sequence learning and NLP when you can find uh, many things that I said today. Uh, there are also the, the guide, of course, and there is also this blog here, which presents another kind of model, uh, which is the question answering one, where we we want given a text and a question point uh, a certain point, the part of text that answers the question. And so, if you're interested in, in to knowing uh, how this model works, I encourage you to watch this blog. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, these word clouds were were done using uh, some. Uh, word embeddings of phrases and distances to the world. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this, uh, for your attention. And now we will uh, answer some questions.